Lecture 38, Erasmus. I grew up in Brooklyn in the shadow of Erasmus Hall High School, named after the great Dutch humanist Desiderius Erasmus, 1466-1536, who is the subject of the present lecture. I remember vividly when I was a kid there was a column in the Brooklyn section of the New York Daily News suggesting in no uncertain terms how dumb it was to name a New York City high school after a Dutchman nobody had ever heard of. Down the road, the road being Bedford Avenue, was James Madison High School, and if you went all the way to the water to Coney Island, there was Abraham Lincoln High School. Everybody knew who those guys were, and they were Americans to boot. But there was a certain logic. The school was meant to be a reminder of the time when Brooklyn, after all, was a Dutch settlement, which indeed it was in colonial times. As for the fame part, probably true that very few people in Brooklyn in the 50s had much of a sense of who Erasmus was, but that's more as the pity, because in Erasmus's own time, everyone knew who he was. One of the most famous figures in Europe, and not just among a small scholarly community of like-minded men, fellow humanists like Thomas More, who was a best friend of his. He was part of a much wider society, uh, one of those people who I guess nowadays would have the title public intellectual. His fame throughout Europe was achieved by few other writers and scholars in European history. Though Dutch by birth, he lived in many parts of Europe. He was a kind of restless pilgrim throughout his life. He traveled and lived in England, in Rome, in Germany, in Switzerland. These were, in fact, all places that he called home for a while. And his travels would have been even more extensive had he accepted all of the invitations that he received. Noblemen really wanted him at their dinner table. And his influence in subsequent writers is also amazingly strong. We will see this a little bit later on when we talk of writers of the stature of Rabelais and Cervantes. Uh, their works essentially are dependent on Erasmus to a very great extent. First thing to know about him that's important in terms of his intellectual life, in terms of the kinds of things that he characteristically wrote and thought about, was that he was an enormously important biblical scholar. In fact, he was responsible for a Greek edition of the New Testament, which was published in 1516. He wrote a life of the early Christian father, St. Jerome, which is kind of interesting. He always had a great affinity for Jerome. One reason was because Jerome was the father responsible for taking the Hebrew and Greek text of the Bible and turning it into Latin. The Latin version of Jerome became standard for well over a thousand years in the West. And he saw, therefore, that Jerome's life was clearly a kind of model for his own. Jerome, as it turns out, was one of his two favorite authors. And it's also, I think, not an accident that of those early church fathers, folks like Jerome and Augustine and Ambrose and Gregory, Jerome was the most learned and certainly the most learned in languages. So there was a real role model thing going on there uh, between Erasmus and Jerome. The work that we're going to concentrate on today the work for which he was best known in his time and in our own is a work of satire called The Praise of Folly. But before we get there, I want to say a little bit about another work that he wrote, one that for obvious reasons is not all that popular today because it is a sort of handbook of Christian piety. But it's a work that tells us a lot about the way in which Erasmus thought about things. It's a work called the Enchiridion, which translates as, and its subtitle is, A Handbook of a Christian Soldier. Also, and not coincidentally, this was the title of a work by the great patristic writer St. Augustine, 
So he's deliberately writing a kind of imitation of what Augustine had done in the 5th century. The word Enchiridion, it's Greek in its etymology, is also a pun. It not only means handbook, but it also can mean dagger, and therefore weapon. So one of the key ideas here is to explain what the weapons are of a Christian soldier. And for Erasmus, well, first of all, he assumes that prayer is going to be one of the weapons, but he assumes that the most important thing that a Christian warrior can have at his disposal is a thorough knowledge of Scripture. We'll see how that's important because, of course, it leads to what he has to say about language and the nature of language. It means learning from the original text themselves. The second thing is that religion is not all about outward signs and devotion. It's about interior disposition, and that interior disposition is manifest in the way we put things into action. How well do we act out the twin commandments of loving God and our neighbor? Okay, this language business. How do you prepare for learning scripture? Number one, you learn the languages. How do you do that? Well, you have to get good at the languages by reading the best examples that are found there. In the case of Greek, for Jerome, that meant very specifically learning the ancient pagan authors. Pagan works are going to be a great help. And Erasmus makes an important blanket statement in the Enchiridion. He says, any truth that you come upon, any time, any place, is Christ's truth, which puts him, I think, in line with many uh, of the early Christian fathers. Origen comes to mind, thinker who said, we can't really think about how to interpret the Bible unless we learn about interpreting texts in general. And the people who told us how to do that are the classical writers and the classical scholars, and we need the tools of pagan philosophy. So it seems to me that we can use that. Again, that kind of slogan, any truth you come upon any place is Christ's, gives a very nice working definition of what has come to be called Christian humanism. The work for which he's best known, The Praise of Folly. The Latin title, he wrote the work in Latin, about which we'll say more in a bit, is called Morii Encomium. Morii, of course, is the word for folly, uh, moria in its nominative case, and uh, we know it etymologically, uh, what I was told when I was in high school, is that a sophomore is a sophos moras, a wise fool, okay? Uh, and encomium means encomium. Well, it's a very wonderful, witty, and ambiguous title, as a matter of fact, because it can be interpreted in a number of different senses. First of all, it's a pun. We mentioned already the friendship between Erasmus and Moore, and Erasmus was living in England and a friend to Moore during the time that he was writing A Praise of Folly. It can be punningly translated as praise of Moore, which means that he's praising Moore, or he could also be saying, this is the sort of stuff that Moore would also be saying, or, gee, this stuff is so goofy, I really wouldn't want to say it, but that guy Thomas Moore would. In other words, there's a wonderfully witty, playful, and sometimes ambiguous relationship, not only between the two men, but also in the praise of folly itself. It's a work that is, as we'll see, very hard to pin down. Praise of folly also means that folly, as the object of praise, can receive it in the way that we say, let us now praise famous men, or in the ancient world, it was a kind of standard rhetorical set piece to give an oration of praise. Let's say, I want to praise philosophy today, or I want to write in praise of truth, in praise of wisdom. Moore is playing off of that tradition and saying, I got a really cool idea, let's praise folly. But of course, folly is also presented as the speaker in this book, so that personification, an actual character, is the speaker, and the other meaning, or an other meaning of the title, is the kind of praise that Folly herself can give. What precisely might it mean 
to be praised by folly. Well, all of those things are present, and all of those things make it hard to pin down because we're trying to imagine as we're going through the work what meaning of folly is most applicable at any particular point along the way. And indeed, what I would say is that even though it was the most popular of his works in his time, it is the work that is most influential in those later writers like Rabelais, like Cervantes, and surely in our own, most popular does not necessarily mean best understood. He was influenced in his work by his other favorite writer. On the Christian side of things, we have St. Jerome. On the pagan side of things, we have a second century, second century in the Christian era, that is to say, Greek satirist by the name of Lucian. Lucian says, in talking about one of his characters, how laughingly he speaks the truth. What Erasmus loved about Lucian was the way he mixed the serious with banter, the way in which the two were combined such that banter, frivolity, could be a means toward seriousness. And this is obviously central to what goes on in the praise of folly. It starts out innocently enough with a re relatively gentle analysis of the folly of the human condition. And what Erasmus picks up on uh, are some of the things that uh, are just sort of crazy about the human condition. What a nutty idea is human procreation, for example. Um, just not only talking about the silliness, looked on from a, per a certain perspective, the silliness of the act of generation itself. You, you, you do what? Uh, as you know, kids respond when they first hear the facts of life. But also, he goes on to say, how nuts do you have to be to agree to become a parent and all that that entails? And he also says, in human life, each age has kind of the folly that is peculiar to that age. So he talks about, let's say, parents who dote on children. Every parent thinks that his own child is the most gorgeous in the world. He says, you come across some, uh, his words, uh, cross-eyed kid and say, this is absolutely gorgeous. A modeling career, a career on the stage is obviously uh, what, what's going to be in his future. There's a sense, in other words, in which folly shows how we are blind uh, to things that everybody else can see. He gets a little bit more serious as he gets up ahead of steam, and he makes some very interesting observations. He says, fools are really necessary to society because they are the only ones who are going to be able to speak truth to power. Nobody else is going to be stupid enough to say something that might cost them a job or favor at court. Fools say what's on their mind because they don't know any better. And this is what is most necessary in order to have a good political environment. In fact, one of the things that the Renaissance humanists like Erasmus, like Moore, and like their followers were obsessed with is the idea of flattery as the condition for politics because the sense is that if leaders don't have somebody to speak the truth to them, they will not have good advice. And in fact, when Thomas More was put to death, uh, the humanist community, we'll talk about that in the lec next lecture, but when More was put to death, for opposing Henry VIII, one of the things that so incensed the humanist community of Europe was that here was somebody who was put to death because he refused to flatter. In any case, fools say what's on their mind, and we can also see how that tradition continues in a writer like Shakespeare. Notice that in plays like King Lear or, or Twelfth Night, you have people at court whose position is fool, which allows them to say things that nobody else could get away with. And the implication is that they are sometimes the only ones who are willing to speak the truth. Okay, Then there's a huge shift that takes place when he begins to direct the idea of folly against religious abuse. 
The irony and the satire get fairly savage at that point. He directs it against three targets, really. First, he attacks the theologians. They're called in this work and in the work of other humanist writers, scholastic theologians. Now, scholastic is a very elastic word. It means a number of different things depending on the context. Scholastic can simply mean that which goes on in the schools. And from Erasmus' point, point of view, that which goes on in the universities. But it also means those who teach according to a certain methodology. Now, here's the problem. Those of us who have an affinity for the previous period, for the Middle Ages, would be quick to remind somebody like Moore or somebody like Erasmus, both of whom talk against the folly of scholastic philosophy, that in the Middle Ages it was in fact an enormously powerful tool and one of the great accomplishments in fact of the Middle Ages. And I think again because the humanists are you know, sort of almost define themselves in opposition to scholastic ways of thought, it's important to say something about what it first was and what it had become by the time of Erasmus. Um, let's begin with a question. Can reason come to know whether there is a God? The scholastic way of dealing with this, as presented in a representative figure like Thomas Aquinas would say, it seems that reason cannot know, and then list all of the arguments against the fact that reason can come to know God. And then he would say, on the contrary, quote some biblical source and then give all of the reasons for why, uh, all of the reasons why you can come to know knowledge of God. And then tries to sort of create some kind of synthesis and then goes back to the original objection and says, let's see what was good in those original objections and let's see what we have to reject. In all of that, it's a method that allows you to bring together the most various kinds of sources from the Bible, from the church fathers, from pagan philosophers. In other words, exactly what the humanists are doing later, the scholastics did in their own way in their philosophical discourse. The problem with this is that what was an active, vibrant, and dynamic tool during, let's say, the lifetime of Aquinas became something a little bit different as it became kind of establishment, first of all, and then became formalized. What happened in scholastic discourse is that the questions themselves seem to become more important for their own sake, or as the humanists said, for the sake of demonstrating the ingenuity of the folks who were propounding them, and that it became a kind of formalism, and so the language itself was debased. Again, a very important concern because another way of defining the humanist position is we want to go back to those original languages and learn them as well as we can. And those included, of course, not simply Hebrew and Greek for the Bible, but also Latin, the Latin that was written by great pagan authors such as Cicero. Well, one of the things that the humanists had against scholastic Latin was that it too became rote and formalistic. It's almost as though, almost like learning a catechism with certain key phrases, you could formulate your own series of scholastic arguments. It became, you've got the catchphrases, then simply fill in the blank blanks and kind of crank it out. Uh, it, it almost became a kind of theology or philosophy of accounting. So what happens is that Folly attacks all of these folks big time. They teach in the schools, they teach according to a certain methodology where things are ordered, numbered, done in detail, and they're really not interested in truth or in the point of it all. It's not going to help them lead a Christian or more Christian life. So the rejection of the scholastic method one of the hallmarks of humanism. Second, it's interesting to see that folly attacks religious and in particular those in monastic orders. There's a kind of neat one-liner in the praise of folly to capture the spirit of criticism here. Uh, some of these monks, uh, folly goes on to say, are as afraid to touch money 
as they are afraid to touch poison. But, he says, they don't forbear wine or women. Well, it's a neat way, of course, of targeting both religious hypocrisy, which Rasmus saw as a huge problem in his day, and again that sense of mistaking uh, the letter for the spirit, only being on the outside, only sort of being there uh, on uh, the surface. Third, folly attacks religious rulers, not excluding the popes of his own time. In fact, in another one of his works, Erasmus writes a dialogue called Julius Exclusus. Pope Julius dies, goes up to heaven, is met by St. Peter. They have a dialogue back and forth, and ultimately he's kicked out of heaven uh, because his life doesn't seem to have been particularly Christian. So uh, what happens is that you have this uh, an enormous uh, kind of um, uh, attack on all kinds of religious abuses in his own time. Now, it's interesting to see where this places Erasmus, because, of course, this is a time of tremendous religious foment, and Erasmus is roughly contemporary with Martin Luther, whose works mark the break uh, uh, in Western Christianity between Catholic and Protestant. And it's interesting to sort of follow not only their respective careers, but the, the way in which their careers intersected. Early on, Erasmus and Luther had uh, an exchange of letters, and it seems to be the case that they were in agreement with each other in terms of not only what the abuses were, but ways to um, somehow deal with them. But later on, when Luther breaks with the church, Erasmus sees just how differently he is theologically from the position uh, represented by Luther. Now, it's sort of interesting to come back to Erasmus and see, well, where does that put him? Uh, here is somebody who, from within Catholic Christendom, is busy, busy criticizing abuse of the church. Uh, he must have been um, well-loved for that. Well, the Protestants didn't like him very much because he didn't go nearly far enough as far as they were concerned. He held to Catholic orthodoxy on important doctrinal issues. The Catholics were very suspicious of the guy because, of course, he looked like a closet Protestant to them, uh, so that this sense, I think, of uh, being uh, in the middle and trying to mediate, uh, while ultimately it's a very honorable position and one that he did very well, uh, was also a position uh, that gave him a very peculiar relationship to the religious controversies of his time. And one could, I think, at least make an educated guess that one of the reasons why he writes in such an oblique fashion, that is to say, that when he talks about folly, it's hard to exactly pin him down, is that that well suits uh, his position as somebody who is trying to kind of negotiate uh, between several implacable positions. The praise of folly takes another really interesting turn as we move toward the end. It turns out that this condemnation of religious abuse is not by any means either the end or the most important part of what is there. Folly, in its final manifestation, becomes the mark of a true Christian. Wow, what's that one all about? Well, first of all, Erasmus is being biblical rather than original in presenting this position uh, because Paul himself talks about the folly of the Christian life. Okay, uh, He talks about the cross in particular being a form of folly. So what Erasmus does is simply take this idea and expand on it using the language of Paul. He talks about the folly of the incarnation, the fact that God becomes human. In thinking about this, I think it's very interesting that there's maybe more than a suggestion here that the structure, 
of the work might be a little tighter than one would at first realize. Somebody reading this book, especially somebody reading it for the first time, is going to see it as going all over the place, as a jumping from one thing to the next without clear connectives. But in fact, if at the beginning he talks about the folly that is part of the human condition, and then in the end he says, let's take a look at the folly of the incarnation, the fact that God became human, then what you have is really bookends to the work, that the beginning is really a kind of prologue uh, telling us uh, where we're going to wind up at the end. And of course, uh, he can take it even further that if um, Christ is a fool uh, for taking on the human condition in some sort of general way, what could possibly more, be more foolish than that except perhaps for dying uh, on the cross? It's clear then that the meaning of folly itself is progressively shifting. Okay? In the beginning, it's all about the various ways in which we are self-deceived. And I might add that this notion of self-deception is also an extraordinarily important aspect of Renaissance humanism. That all of the thinkers that we're going to be looking on uh, in a bit in subsequent lectures, Montaigne, for example, Rabelais, and then even carrying it down to folks like Cervantes. And finally, when we get to the end and see Pascal, they're all going to be tremendously aware of the way in which our self-deception keeps us from a knowledge of the truth. And that an awful lot of those thinkers who are thought to be skeptical don't seem so much um, opposed to or don't seem so much uh, convinced that there's no such thing as true reason. What they seem to be conscious of is the way in which it's harder and harder to use that reason uh, when you're in the midst of some kind of crazed obsession. And Erasmus is one of the first of the humanists to document this uh, in, in such detail. Well, uh, a position like this turns out to be not especially easy uh, to get. That is to say, uh, just as his religious position uh, presented itself as something that many Catholics were opposed to, many Protestants were opposed to, so also is the idea uh, of this book. And if you ask yourself who got it originally, uh, the answer is, well, probably his original circle of humanist friends. It would certainly be clear like, that somebody like Thomas More would not only get it, I think this is a real sense in which the two of them, this is a bad word to use for such esteemed thinkers, egged each other on, as we'll see in the next lecture with More's Utopia, uh, we can find a lot of Erasmus in More and a lot of More in Erasmus. But there were a great number of conservative theologians who certainly didn't get it. One of them, and this is sort of a, a kind of neat little anecdote of just what it means to not get it, one of them uh, wrote to Erasmus and he suggested somewhat indignantly that Erasmus's job, now that he had published a work called Praise of Folly, wouldn't it be appropriate, all right, if he wrote back, I'm sorry, if he wrote a work called A Praise of Wisdom. Well, what uh, Erasmus did, uh, he was a nicer guy, I think, in his letters than in his work. He didn't you know, decide to write the satirical letter that one would be tempted to write. That's what I did do, dummy. You just didn't get it. Uh, what Erasmus did is that he wrote back explaining what it was that he, in fact, tried to do. And I would suggest that for these and many other reasons, uh, Erasmus and the praise of folly is clearly worth a very close look today. It's also interesting, it seems to me, that one of the ways in which this sort of humanist circle, you know, they write in Latin to a relatively small group of people. What's the point of doing it in Latin? Well, one point is that it keeps the community international. But, of course, it also means that it is kept to a relatively small community, so that you have the kind of paradox of soul brothers throughout Europe, and soul sisters in some cases as well, but you don't have a very large community in any one, in any one culture. And it seems to be particularly interesting 
that it is the great vernacular writers, again we've mentioned them, uh, in particular Rabelais and Cervantes, who take the work of Erasmus and who vernacularize it later on.